It's about my announcements again. I don't need those. There was, oh man, there was one thing I was going to announce again. I forgot what it was again. It was important too, y'all. It wasn't, it wasn't something I just lost. It was important. Let me think about it for a second. If it comes to me, I may stop, I may stop to renounce this. Dang it, what was it? Oh, whatever. Okay, so <laughs> must not have been too important. All right, so if you would, please turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 10. We'll read four verses all the way through 13. And when you get there, would you stand, please, in the reading of the inerrant, infallible word of the Holy Word of God? And it reads like this, verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Pray with me, please. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for this message that you've prepared. Um, Lord, if there's anything in it that doesn't belong, cancel it. If there's anything needed that needs to be added, Father, add it so that your name is known and your words are heard this morning and no one else has cast me aside or no one can remember my name but yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. So um, I picked this section out this morning because it's, it's often been uh, quoted out of context and all kinds of other things. Uh, we, we, I, wanted to, I wanted to give the context of Philippians 4.13 for you this morning. I had an idea of what I wanted to say. I had an idea of how to connect this to uh, the world at large generally and our church specifically and, uh, and a, few other, a few other things that are going on in our church. That said, we had a shutdown day on a Tuesday and Thursday at the school where we shut the whole school down to do a mock star test, which, which it just, we're just preparing the kids for the protocol in the class where they are, to, they, are to, they are to test by themselves, to remain silent, all the things that we do while we're testing so that when we get to the test day, it's not a, uh, it's not a surprise for them. Well, I just decided to read the, read the book of Philippians. It's a short book. You see it's four chapters, and my Bible is two pages. In my little mini Bible that I carry, carry with me, uh, where I can hold under the desk where I can read it while the kids are testing. Um, it's, a, it's, a very small, it's a very small book. It, t- it took me about 20 minutes to read, but the sermon began to write itself. Okay, um, Paul, being the master of the logical argument, he, he stacks information on top of itself. He, he, um, he connects ideas and finally hits you with a therefore at the end to give you a cohesive and often conviction-inducing idea. So I want to basically cover the entire book of Philippians this morning. <laughs> draw some convicting conclusions from that key text, uh, Philippians 4, 10 through 13. So I promise you, it's a short book, so it won't be, it won't be very long. I'll get into the key text pretty quickly, but I kind of want to cover the entire book of Philippians. Y'all okay with that? Sure, I'm going to do it anyways. <laughs> unlike other letters, though, unlike other letters, this one's a little bit different. Uh, the other letters, like we're teaching in, uh, in the youth, we're teaching through Galatians. Uh, Romans is another one, uh, Colossians, Corinthians, Ephesians. They really, ha- Paul really heavily relies on the Old Testament and his education in the Old Testament to relate things to the New Covenant, to relate things to how, how spiritually God works in our lives. He, re- he relies on the Old Testament. Here in Philippians, it's a little bit different because it's more of a pragmatist kind of view. Now, when I say pragmatist, that has a negative connotation because Joel Osteen is a pragmatic preacher. Um, a lot of these, pro, these, uh, these word, of, word of faith and, and um, what do you call it, the prosperity gospel preachers are pragmatists. And what pragmatism is, they're saying is, well, it worked for me, it should work for you. You don't have enough faith if, you're not, if it's not working for you. That's pragmatism. It worked for me, okay? This is how we teach our kids. Look, this is how you do it because this is how I do it. That's pragmatist, right? You're not learning theory from a book. You're not learning something that my, that, that's something, we're not teaching our kids how to use a screwdriver based on ancient theory from, from the Neanderthals, right? It's something that's, that we did this way. You don't use a, you don't use a Phillips head screwdriver on a flat point uh, screw. But Paul relies on his experience in the, in the region to give, them a, to give them some encouragement. So let's start in chapter 1. And in chapter 1, if you're following along with the, uh, with, the, with the outline, chapter 1 is kind of the greeting and thanks, his normal greeting and thanks that he gives to the, to the epistles. Okay? And uh, 
He's thanking the church in that first section, verse 1 through 18. He's thanking the church for their very existence because they're in Greece. It's a, it's a, every church is in a city which is, a, which is in idolatry. Every church is in a sinful place. Every church is in a place that needs outreach. And there's supposed to be a light, a city set on a hill. Amen? Now, he ends this section with verse 18 where he makes clear the intention behind what they're doing is the most important thing. Now, I'm a math teacher in the classroom. Okay, And I try to help my kids understand that why we do things is much more important than how we do things. And how we do things is much more important than what we do. And I use an example, and it's kind of crass, okay? So I wanna, I wanna, it's, it's very provocative. So let me use it with you right now. There's a, there's a problem in our society uh, at large, in the whole world. There's a large biological problem in HIV and AIDS. There is. There's, there's, it's... it's, it's it's gotten into so many different regions, so many different areas. It's a, it's a problem. But it can be fixed pretty easily. All you have to do is take all those people who have it and just kill them. Now, I love the silence right now because you're going, uh, did he just say that? Okay, the way this is passed is through sex, it's a sexually transmitted disease. So if there are no more people that have it, then no more people will get it. That is the way that it's supposed to be. But my kids, when I, when I show this to 7th and 8th graders, they are horrified. And they have questions like, well, what about the babies who got it from their mothers? What about them? So they got to go. They go, you can't do that. I said, but that, so you're telling me that how we get rid of this is more important than getting rid of it? And they'll say, okay, okay, I see. That, that, that's why you can't just choose C on an answer choice. Okay, I understand. I can understand, coach. I get it. But... Paul even goes further and says, more important than how you do things, the process by which you work is why you're doing something. Your heart is more important. And he, I, I'll relate this to Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, where this is not in there, Paul. Don't, worry, don't look for it. It's not up there. But you can turn in your, in your Bible and look in Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, where Paul says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. God will not be mocked. We can try to mock we can try, we want to spit and rail at God, but God, His purpose will be carried out. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe, and He will not be mocked, even though we think we're mocking Him. Look what, look what Paul says in Philippians uh, chapter 1, verse 18. We're in the same book here, Philippians chapter 1, verse 18. He says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Now, in the context here, he's talking about people who proclaim Jesus to get something, to get something back for themselves. He says, whether in pretense or in truth, those are two opposite ideas, truth or falsehood, Christ is proclaimed and in that I rejoice. God is not mocked even if Christ is proclaimed to get something out of you. I was saved. I was saved in a Word of Faith church, a, the, the Word of Faith, the Word of Faith churches up in East Texas. I was saved as a child out of that. And I look back and go, what kind of, of, what kind of heresy was I under? When, when, a, when a pastor would hold, his, hold his, his Bible in his hand like this and put it behind his back, hold his finger in his Bible and never open it, would say things from the Bible but never tell you where they're from, would never give the full context of the full counsel of the gospel so that he can be paid, so that you can be, you can be, you can be satisfied knowing that your money is going to a place where it's supposed to be. It's, it was foul. But whether in pretense or in truth, I was saved out of that. Whether that was in pretense, that was in falsehood, or in truth, Christ is proclaimed because God is not mocked. I thought that was a beautiful picture here. And he continues in, uh, in verse 19 through 29 uh, in which he discusses his imminent death. He's going to die. Okay, This is a, one of the later letters. He knows he's going to die. And he actually talks about having the choice whether to live or die. And he talks about how um, he would rather stay and, and minister to the Philippian church. So he's going to do that. He's pretty sure he's going to do that. You can see in... Uh, and he, he, he talks about the suffering that he has and, and how the Philippian church will have to suffer in the same thing that he does. Look at uh, chapter, chapter 1, verse 29 through 30. For it has been granted to you that for, excuse me, that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engage in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. Paul is suffering currently. And this Philippian church will suffer as well. Because they are Christ, because they are a city on a hill, they will suffer for the sake of Christ. They're saying the same suffering that Paul's, Paul's going through. The, the church at large, this is to the universal church at, at large, that we will suffer for the sake of Christ if we're his. But according to Paul, persecution is coming to Christians, and the battle will be fought and won by Christ, but not without casualty. 
The suffering is considered by Paul as a gift. It has been granted to you. Do you know if you get a, a grant from the United States government, how much do you have to pay back of a grant? None. You don't have to pay a grant back. It's not a loan. Paul, God's not loaning you something. He's granting you, gifting you suffering. Oh, me, huh? Now, in, in chapter 2, we talk about Jesus' example of suffering and how he is the humble, the, the example of humility. In verse 1 through 30, I'll give you three of, of excuse me, four headings for this. Um, I've been listening to a lot of Steve Lawson, Stephen Lawson, and he, he gives headings for his stuff. Uh, and they're, they're this. In verse 3 through 4, you have the requirement. In verse 5 through 8, you have the right way. In verses 9 through 11, you have the result. In verses 12 through 13, you have the response. The requirement in chapter 3 through 4, if you're writing this down in your outline, the requirement is in chapter 2, verse 3 through 4. In our suffering, this is what we do. This is what we are required to do. Watch this, verse 3. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What's the requirement then? Be humble, elevate others. That's our requirement. Not be humble, kind of, and make sure your family's taken care of. Be humble, elevate others. That's what it says. Think of others more highly than yourself. Amen? Don't argue with me. Argue with the Word. Argue with Paul if you can. Then there's a right way to do this. There's a right way to do this. If you're going to be humble, it's not a false humility. This has to be from the heart. There's a right way and a wrong way to be humble. There's a false humility and a proper humility. There's a false preaching and a, and, a, and, a, and a true preaching. There's a false gospel and a real gospel. There's only one of the right way to do this. Uh, again, I tell my kids in the math, room, math, math classroom, there are a lot of ways to get things wrong, but there are very few ways to get things right. And I go back to what my dad used to tell me. I, I could have sworn he said this. My mom, says, my mom says she don't ever remember him saying this, but I remember my dad saying the right way and the easy way are rarely ever the same way. I, I don't think that I made that up. I think he said that for real. <laughs> But it would be good if I made it up. I'm going to tell my son. I tell my sons that, that my dad told me, so maybe they'll tell, they'll tell their sons the same thing. The right way and the easy way are rarely ever the same way. And Paul gives us the right way in verse 5 through 8. Verse 5, he says this. Let me find it. Here it is. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. It's saying it's coming from the heart and the right mindset. Verse 6, who, that's Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. The King James says, uh, did not think it robbery to be equal with God. I think I said that right. Verse 7, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and, have, and being found in the human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So what's the right way? The right way is obedience with the right heart, obedience with the right mindset. And I'll say this, if you have made a profession of faith, my wife is texting me right now. Hopefully it's something important. Uh, <laughs> if, if you have made a profession of faith and not followed, and not followed in obedience, if you've not followed in the, in, if your heart is not bound to obedience to God, not because that's just what we do, but, but, in, but in a servitude, in a love for God, then you need to check your salvation. You need to check your profession of faith because a prayer does not save you, ladies and gentlemen. The baptism we talked about last week does not save you. Coming to church does not save you. Being on the roster doesn't save you, definitely. Watching this online doesn't save you. Giving to the church in tithes does not save you. Only God can do that through faith in Christ, and that's it. By His grace, He has to do a work. And if you don't see the work of God, which is followed by the fruit of the Spirit, you need to check your salvation and check it quickly. Now, the result of this, the result of Christ being the, the perfect example of humility, this is verse 9 through 11 is the result. He says in verse 9, this is just a continuation of verse 8, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the, glo to the glory of God the Father. So is the result that we are glorified? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. The result in our humility is that Christ is glorified. 
Even though Christ was glorified by God in his humility, he's also glorified by God in our humility because we show the reflection of God in the humility of everybody else that we are lowered to elevate others even though they're trying to lower themselves and be humble. It's a, it's a beautiful picture of us being at the bottom and Christ being at the top. And we're not climbing a ladder. We've already been granted the adoption as sons if you are his. And if you're not, then your humility is false. We do everything, everything, solely Deo Gloria, to only to the glory of God. The point is not that we are glorified, but Christ is glorified in us as we suffer in his name. Paul solidifies this in the very next verse. Now that we know that the result is Christ's glorification in our humility, what do we do with that? What, what is the result? What is the response that we should have? Paul continues in verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, this is your response. Here it is. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, you're going to have to forget my toe step for a minute because we have lost, we've only heard the first of this at the end of verse 12, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And we say that to each other. We've, I've heard it in this church. People have said that and I say amen. Verse 13 says, everything we do, for it's God who works in you both to will and to work for our good pleasure for our prosperity, for our health, for his good pleasure. The problem comes when we try to will and work for our own pleasure. Or, please forgive me, for our children. This church specifically, Community Baptist Church, is not only inundated with low tithes and offerings due to economy, Congress, COVID, etc., but low attendance, which is more and more accounted to children's activities. Again, those of you that are here are not, here, are, not, are, are not missing because of children's activities. So I know that this is kind of church preaching to the choir, but this is not something that, that falls lightly on my heart. Kids spend 40 hours a week in school, okay? They're eight hours a day, five days a week, 40 hours a week in school, unless your kids are homeschooled. They spend eight to 12 hours per week. That's about two to three hours per week on extracurricular activities. This, is, this includes uh, band, sports, uh, clubs, etc. And three, maybe three, as many as four hours per week being taught the Word. Capital W Word. This Word. This one right here. Who's going to have the greater influence? Now, I, I played football in school. I played baseball. I played basketball in middle school. It was funny to watch me run up and down the court. We had, we had some bigs. We had some big it was It was funny. Uh, I, was in, I was in track and field. I, played, I, played, I threw, the, threw the shot and disc. Um, and there was a thing back then in the, in the, uh, in the, in the 90s when uh, actually the early 2000s. It, this really carried over from the 80s, okay? There was a thing called the Fat Boy Relay. All right, when you got the biggest line when you could, John's back there nodding his head because he knows exactly what I'm talking about. There was a thing where you took the biggest guys you could and put them on the, it used to be the four by 100 relay because it was funny to see those guys hand off the stick at 100 yards a piece. But our coach just thought it would be fun to do a four by 400 relay. And it takes all day because we're big dudes. <laughs> it, takes, it takes all day to get four guys to run 400 meters. I don't know if you know how long that is. That's one lap around the track. <laughs> one lap. I did all that, and it was fun. We had, and there's nothing inherently wrong with sports, activities, groups, clubs, or what have you. But these cannot infringe on your, spirit, your child's spiritual edification and education. These can become an idol and have very quickly to fathers especially, if our fathers are even a presence in their home. This bleeds into our children, this idolatry. Who would rather play ball? go to band events, go to camps, or whatever their little hearts desire, because we have not made the assembling of the body of Christ important. We would rather do anything than come to church, come to a place where someone's going to stand and deliver a message from the Holy Word of God and convict our hearts and, and drive us closer to Christ and further away from ourselves. Amen? That's very quiet amen. I don't mean to isolate band and sports parents, but bring us all into conviction here. 
from the kids to the great grands. I'm just as guilty of this. I'm not, I'm not talking about you. It's just talking about me too. I'm just as guilty of this as anyone who has ever parented a child. Let me, let me explain to you. When Jamie and I were first married, before we had, before we had kids, I was a welder, a uh, pipe fitter welder. I made more money than any 21-year-old should ever be allowed to make. Um, and I would rather make that overtime pay than go to church and give it away to a group of people who does Lord knows what with my money. I'd rather do that. I'd rather, I'd rather keep it. But I was the one in idolatry to the money, not the church. I was the one in idolatry, and our, and our marriage nearly ended because of my own idolatry, because I wouldn't give it up. And what changed was, one day I used to cash my check. I used to get cash, get, get, get cash out of my check and keep it in my wallet, because it felt good to have that much money in my, in my wallet. Again, I was 21 years old, super smart. Uh, so what I did was, Jamie over and over again, so the lights got turned off multiple times. I'm just kidding, I'm making a lot of money here. Lights got turned off. We're having to eat ramen noodles, you know, uh, you know cut up a piece of sausage and, you know, eat, that's, 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 that's your meal for, for the day. Or just a couple of cups of rice with, with way too much uh, red chili pepper in it to spice it up. I was in idolatry. Now, after we had, after we had Zeke, uh, no, not after we had Zeke. Jamie convinced me to go back to school. And it was miraculous that we even could because I went to East Texas Baptist University in Marshall. It's a private Christian university. And because of my previous uh, academic, uh, academic success in Panola College, uh, I was able to go for like $75 per semester, not including room and board. I had to pay for my own room and board. Again, miraculous. I pretty much, God pretty much, I tried to make a fool out of Jamie and God made a fool out of me. That's what ended up happening. But when I was there, I would rather work all night tutoring and finishing my homework, which was significant, by the way, than going home and husbanding, being a husband to my wife and a father to my son. And our marriage nearly ended because of it. I'm telling you, this idolatry is a big thing. If, if your, marriage, your marriage will suffer, your, the, the, the relationship with your kids will suffer, the relationship with the people around you will suffer, you will be an isolated island because of your idolatry. And it wasn't until I came into holy conviction that God began to produce the, the, the first, excuse me, produce fruit in my life such that a tithe was not a duty or an obligation sprung from doubt, but a privilege to minister to the man of God, his family, and the body of Christ by extension, growing the kingdom a little, little at a time like the mustard seed that Christ talks about in Matthew 13. My marriage wasn't a wife who wanted to fight, but one who wanted me to be better so that she could be better, so that our family could be better for both of our families, the Bryans and the Durs, so that we could grow in Christ like we're supposed to and get closer to Christ so we got closer together. Isaac came later, by the way. Isaac was, let's call it a surprise. <laughs> a pleasant surprise, but a surprise nonetheless. Now, please understand, please understand that I know it's, it's very quiet. If y'all, y'all, I know y'all can't hear this online, but it's very quiet in this room right now, almost like I'm talking to myself. Uh, and the reason is because this is a hard message. It's a hard thing to, to, really, to really look at yourself and see where your feet are standing right now. Uh, uh, John Calvin, which was one of the reformers, said that the, the heart is a, an idol factory. He called, and that, that's not the exact quote, but that's pretty much what he called, our hearts and our minds are a factory for idols. If we remove one idol, we, we tear down one idol, we put one other in its place until God comes and stands in the place of the idol. And until then... And even after then, we'll still try. But don't be deceived. Even when we try, God is not mocked. But to be, under, to be able to understand the gospel, which is the good news, the bad news must be accepted. You have to see the bad news before you can see the good news. And the bad news is we are all great sinners. We are all great idolaters. But Jesus is a great Savior. But salvation, justification through salvation is only the first step. It's only the first step. We must continue to walk in Christ as He walks toward the kingdom of God. We must continue to walk in Christ as we march towards our death. We must walk with Him, guided by Him in every single step. Filled with Him like a glove is filled with your hand. Um, when we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit, a lot of times the picture is of a cup and it's being poured into and it's just overflowing. But the cup is inanimate. It's not doing anything, right? So I heard, I, heard a, uh, I heard a metaphor the other day talking about 
This is the different type of field. The picture is being like, a, like a glove being filled with the hand and being used that way. This is our lives. We are the glove and Christ is the hand that guides us in every single way, even down to the most minute step in our minds, in our hearts, in our, in our, in our marriages, in our pocketbooks, in our jobs. Everything must be guided by God. We are supposed to be a city on a hill, examples to the rest of the world, which is kind of like a skyscraper that everyone can see. But here's the thing. You don't build a sky. How many skyscrapers have you seen being built on the edge of a beach? Very few, right? They don't last long, do they? They just slide right off into the water because that's where the sand goes. To be able to build a skyscraper, you've got to dig down into the bedrock and remove every imperfection. That's the bad news. We have to dig down deep into ourselves and God has to cut out, surgically cut out the heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. Replace it with a solid foundation such that we can, such that, such that we can be built as cities on a hill. You follow what I'm saying here? You smell what I'm stepping in? Now, you may ask. I'm going to try to be like Paul and, 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 and anticipate your questions. And I'll be glad to discuss this with you um, at any point that you want to do that. You may ask, well, John, what about the kids? I want them to get into a good college. I, I need to start now to get my kids into a good college. To which I say, why? Why? So that good college can, it can, can indoctrinate them to be sexually perverse, liberally minded, moral relativists? You want to send your child who has no spiritual education into a place that's going to feed them their food while you have been spiritually starving your child? I've been hinting to Zeke that he may want to think about trade school. Not, not because Zeke, is, Zeke has a mind like very few kids. I, I don't talk, we don't talk to Zeke like an 11-year-old. He's 11? I think he's 11. He's 11, yeah. I don't know anybody's age in my family. Uh, Isaac's three, but I think he's about to turn like seven or something. Uh, but I've been, I've been hinting to him that a trade is an extremely important thing. A man that works with his hands is a problem solver. And a man that will not work should not eat. But what are we teaching our kids in these schools? You know, if you send your kid to a school, well, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> okay. You send, your, you send your kids to the school, they're not going to fail. They're going to come out with a, with a false, sense of, false sense of superiority and security. I did. I did. Now, given that I went and worked for four years as welder, and I had worked with my hands a lot, I started in ninth grade working, as a, working in, in the watermelon fields pitching watermelons. And I worked every summer pitching watermelons for, get this, some of y'all worked for less, $3 an hour. And I thought I was, I was making money. I was making money. Now, I did that for four summers, $3 an hour. And then I got a job at Brookshire Brothers working as a, working as a sacker for $5 an hour, which was minimum wage at the time. This seems like a long time ago. <laughs> $5 an hour. And again, I thought I was banking until I got that first check and they took all them taxes out. And I, I could see my, my boss was a, very, was a good man. Mr., Mr. Haley was a very good man. I think he's still around somewhere. And he taught me a lot. Because my father had died, I had a great father. Um, I, I'd, had, I'd had a great relationship with him. He had taught me a lot about, about, the, about the value of work and the value of a good work ethic. And when I took that into Brookshire Brothers, it was like, it was like, it was like there was a whole other set of five or six hands instead of just mine. Because I, not, because, not because I was so great, but because my dad had taught me how to be a, how to be a man, how to be a, how to be a worker. We go to school, and you know your kids can't fail school. As long as you're paying that tuition, they're not going to fail. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you from being in the system, you're not gonna, they're not going to fail. Uh, see, uh, we, there's a saying when I was in school, C for degree. C for degree, which is ridiculous because degree that has not, doesn't have a C in it. <laughs> but you get C for degree. That's at, that's at private, private school. And it comes from public school, which stands for D for degree. <laughs> Your kid's not going to fail that. Because... We want our kids to come out with a sense of superiority. We want them to feel better at the risk of them being better. We're not teaching our kids in the classroom from pre-K how to be better. We're teaching them that they're fine. We're the problem. 
We have, we have perverted the entire system of education such that everyone is the most important thing in their lives, which is an idol. What about the kids? Your kids may be fine. In my case, God kept his hand around me. But are you really willing to send them to that place that's going to feed them when you haven't? Because you know what they're going to do? They're going to eat. You send your kids to another family? Yeah, Tammy knows. My kid eats at her house. He eats like he never eats at my house. He eats like, like we don't cook at our house. He eats <laughs> he, at everybody's house. Everybody's, that's, the way, that's the way Zeke works. He eats. It's, he, he's, a good, he's good at it. It's not because he's hungry, because that's what we do. We eat. No wonder we lose the good church kids as soon as they taste the real world. God help us. We need a reformation. Here's the thing. The men of the Reformation actually started the Reformation. They didn't wait for somebody to start the Reformation. And if we wait for somebody else to do it for us, it'll be done despite us. Now, off of that, let's get back into Philippians. We get into chapter 3. Chapter 3 is Christ's righteousness, the righteousness in Christ, and a a few warnings. And there's two headings in here. In uh, verse 8 through 11, we see uh, righteousness in humility. Verse 8 through 11. Let's look at chapter 3, verse 8 through 11. Verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing, knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may again, excuse me, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings and becoming becoming like him in death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead by any means possible. Are we willing by any means possible to attain the resurrection from the dead? Or are we willing to do what we're willing to do and not much else? Paul says, I'm willing to follow Christ in death. Jesus said to take up your cross and follow me. You know what the cross was a symbol of? Death. Martyrdom. Murder. He says, Take up your cross and join the death march because you are marching towards your every breath is the next one closest to your last breath. Jesus says, get up, take up your cross and join me in the march towards death. Because in our death, he is glorified according to his will and purpose. Again, I'm not I'm not telling you to go out and look for death. I'm not telling you to go out and find somebody that's willing to kill you. (laughs) That's not that's that's ridiculous. But understand that we are made such that we might suffer even unto death. We might not. We might be given a a country which gives us the right to say what we want. We might be be given a country that, that protects our right to assemble peacefully. And in that case, we think death is having a low pocketbook, making $13 an hour instead of $15 an hour. In verse 18 through 19, in verse 18 through 19, we have advantageous wolves. Look what it says, verse 18. For many of whom I have often told you, and now telling you even with tears, walk as enemies to the cross of Christ. This is talking about people in the Philippian church. Many that are in your church right now, in this church right now, watching online right now. Walk as enemies to the cross of Christ. Verse 19, their end is destruction, and their God, you notice that's a little g? Their God is their belly. And fine, I just lost it. And their glory, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. If you are not following in the obedience to God because you love God, if you're just following obedience because it's what we do, because that's what, what we ha- always have done, because that's what we're going to continue to do. That's tradition. If you, there's a man named Saul, not the king Saul, but Saul of Tarsus, who was very zealous, very zealous for the traditions of his fathers, murdered Christians because of the traditions of his fathers. There are people right now who are walking in the exact same way, even 
in this church. I don't know who you are. I'm not, I'm not calling you out specifically, but I am saying today is the day of salvation. You no longer have to walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. We are great sinners. Christ is a great Savior, and that is the good news of the gospel. And then we get into chapter 4. Chapter 4 is an encouragement and exhortation. This is a lot of times how Paul ends his letter, with encouragement. But in chapter 1, and in verse 1, he hits us with that therefore. Therefore, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, the operative word here is to stand firm. Therefore, stand firm. Stand in your humility. Stand in your faith. Stand on, stand on the gospel. Stand on Christ. Stand on God. Stand on the word. Stand on the scripture. Stand, but stand. And he continues in verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 4. He says, as you're standing, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. That's almost as though it's, it's right there beside you. It's almost like you're holding hands with the Father in your walk. Like you're walking across the street and you grab a hold of your son's hand. I do this with Isaac, and there's sometimes when Isaac just, he'll, he'll jump off the sidewalk and just be flying for a minute because I'm holding on to because he's trying to jump off into, into traffic. It, Getting him out of the, out of the, just closing the door and turn your back on that boy in Walmart parking lot is dangerous because he'll be out. You got to hold on to him. But the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, this is verse 6. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The picture here is to be holding hands with God and saying, God, I need this. And God's saying, okay, here you go. Or, no, you don't. Isaac right now is at home saying, Mom, I need a popsicle. I know. I can hear it. Like, I can hear it right now. I went and got popsicles for him because he's sick right now. That's why Jamie's not here. Isaac's sick. He's got a little, little, he's got a little viral thing. Don't really know what it is. That's why he's staying home. But I messed up and got him popsicles. And now Isaac needs a popsicle. He don't want protein. He doesn't want vegetables. He, he, the boy's a vegetarian to begin with. He'll only, eat, uh, he'll only eat vegetables and he'll eat all the broccoli and carrots in the house, but will not eat a piece of, piece of brisket or a piece of steak, a piece of chicken, nothing. You've got to hide it in chicken and rice. He'll eat a little chicken. But he needs a popsicle. And what do we say to a child that needs a popsicle? No, you don't. No. Eat, drink a cup of water or eat something. Eat something that's not, that's not food. Eat something. No, you don't. God tells us the same thing. God, I need this. No, you don't. Or God, I need this. Here you go. He knows what you need already. He knows what you need before you ever ask it. He gives you before you even ask it. But sometimes he tells you, no, you don't. The peace of God. This is the peace of God. Understanding that he has control and he is a good father, which gives us all that we need and nothing else. So then we get into our text this morning. Verse 10. Verse 10 talks about the need for nourishment. Isaac says, I need a popsicle. No, you don't. You need some food is what you need. Look at verse 10, what it says in verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. This is the Philippian church. You have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. He says, he says you were concerned, but you had no opportunity. Now, this is a, this is a, a different time when you can't just, just Venmo or cash out people some money. Right? You, can't just, you can't just send a package through the mail and to be there the next day across the entire country. Do y'all realize what a privilege that is? I, I got aggravated at Amazon the other day. I bought something on Amazon. It said it would be here the same day. And it wasn't. And I was mad at Amazon. It came the next day. Can you believe that? Have we, anybody experienced that before? I was aggravated. They said they guaranteed to be here today and it's here tomorrow. What, what, kind, of, what kind of world do we live in? This has got, this has got to be the end times. The implication here is that had the church of Philippi had the opportunity, they would have helped him in every way that they could. We must therefore walk in the Lord, acknowledging him in every single thing, all the way down to the gift that he gives us in the form of our pocketbooks. It is a command that we support the body, bring our tithe into the storehouse, but I know that times are getting tight before Christmas. However, let's not let our wallets be what we stand on and instead put them where they're supposed to be, what we sit on, implying that our money's beneath us. We are images of the glory of God. We are. We are as sons and daughters of God. We are being conformed to His image every single day. So don't let your wallet be put between you and God. Don't, let it, don't, don't do it. 
we cannot elevate money above us and then because it becomes an idol. It's absolutely an idol in every single facet of our lives. I mean, just look at the look at the Amazon thing going on right now. Look at the people who are who are who are doing everything they can to make as much money as they can from you. I'm, I'm not here to do that. But I will tell you what Jesus said in Matthew 6. Turn to Matthew 6 real quick. There's one verse in Matthew 6, verse 24. And you know it. But I'll put it out there where you can see it. Apollo put it out there where you can see it. Matthew 6, verse 24 is in the context of Jesus talking about laying your treasures up in heaven. There are earthly treasures and there are heavenly treasures. The earthly treasures are, have, have uh, be destroyed by moth and, and moths and they rust and they, they, they pass away. But the earthly treasures can never be passing away. They can't be stolen. They can't be anything else. So Jesus said in verse 24, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve two masters. There are not two gods. There is only one God, and there is no other one beside him. When you elevate something to his level, you are not elevating anything. You are bringing him down to the level of an idol, and God is not an idol that looks like us. He is above and over every single thing, including the money that we have in our pockets. If you serve your money, you either do or you will hate God. These are the words of Christ himself. You argue with him, not me. So we get into, that's the need for nourishment. Money is not nourishment. Money is not nourishment. We, we pray the Lord's Prayer, which says, Give us this day our daily what? Bread. Bread. The only nourishment that we need physically. Because the Bible also says that man cannot live by bread alone, but by the words of, of Christ. In verse 11, uh, Paul, verse 11 through 12, Paul talks about the secret to survival. Look at verse 11. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I've learned in whatever situation I am, to be content. I've learned to be content in whatever situation. He starts off saying that not that I am speaking of being in need. So I'm going to make an announcement to you real quick. This is not the announcement I was thinking of. I can't remember what that was. But here's what's coming up, okay? Jamie and I are about to embark on another chapter in our lives. With me coming into ministry full-time in January, I have resigned my position at Crosby Middle School uh, as being a teacher, and I will come on full-time, five days a week, to the church to minister to y'all, to be a, to be a body, to be a, a member uh, here that, that I'm will, I, I want to I serve you. Now, this is not, I don't take this step lightly, and, I, and we haven't announced it yet um, for, I should say, reasons. But I'm telling you now that I'm going to be here five days a week answering your phone calls, uh, ministering to you and uh, visiting you in the hospital and trying to help Brother Robert as he, as he deals with his cancer, trying to help Brother Robert in, in a lot of the pastoral duties that I can. I've been running from this for a while, and God's not only made it almost impossible to continue in public education, but impossible to do anything but preach and teach, and I'm so very proud to do this for our church. But Paul says in the end of that verse, right now we're not in need. We're not in need. Um, but Paul says, I've learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Now, if money stays as tight as it is, and please understand that being at the church here, I'm going to be in everybody's business who uses the church money because I think it's, it's, it's our job to be good stewards of the money that, that you have given us to use as a church staff. I'll be in everybody's business. And if you want to see what I spend on the youth, you want to see what I spend on the, on the, on the budget, on the, on the uh, whatever that is up there, sound booth uh, and the music stuff, I'm more than willing to show you because I am responsible to you for the money that I spend in this church. The money that you give me, oh, excuse me, the money that you spend out of your wallet is none of my business. It's not my business. I, and if, if you're not tithing in this church, I'm not going to come meet with you and say, hey, uh, I noticed you hadn't tithed in a few months. Uh, what's up? I'm not going to do that. I will never do that. And I will never ask you for more money than I'm getting right now. I'll never ask you for more money than, I, than I'll be getting when I come in, come in full time. However, so let me say it like this. I'm not going to bug you. I, and your, your money is none of my business. But the money that I use in this church is absolutely your business. Amen? Amen. Okay, so we're, we're in the same place. Now, what God does with his money is none of your business. But what you do with his money is absolutely his business. If you're going to accept the hierarchy from you to me, you better accept the hierarchy from God to you. 
He is over every single thing. He will give you what you need. And if you try to take things in your hands, like Sarah did with her, with her child, she couldn't have a child, so she gave Abraham a child, which caused strife and enmity with Abraham's sons for the rest of eternity. Ishmael and Isaac will always be enemies until Ishmael turns into Isaac, until the families of Ishmael come over to the families of Isaac and give themselves over in faith to Christ our King. Sarah ruined that relationship because she tried to take things into her hands. Don't do the same thing with God's money. And I, did, I, I told you I wasn't going to preach on tithing. This is not a, this is not a sermon on tithing. This is, I'm, just, I'm just letting you know what's going to happen in my family because I'm about to take a $50,000 pay cut to come work here. And I, 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 say, I don't say that lightly. I will never preach on the benefits of tithing or sowing a seed as though you can get something in return for it. Nor will I ever ask you for more money. Your rewards are all spiritual, heavenly, and I will work every day to ensure that this is true. This church family has been so good to me. So in my path to glorify the Father, I will do my best to honor you as we go into this, this time of me coming in ministry full time. Verse 12, Paul says, verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Even with all this, even taking a pay cut, doing all the things that we're about to do, Jamie and I know how to know, know some of these things. We spent nights hungry. We have celebrated being able to cut up a, piece of, a couple of pieces of sausage. Excuse me, let me say that again. We've celebrated being able to cut up a couple of pieces of sausage and ramen noodles. Celebrate it. Like, this, is, this is like eating like kings. And we've also complained over undercooked or overcooked steak and the amount of tithe that we have to give. One of those is better. I'll show you what I'm talking about. Turn to Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs 15. Now, if you know what Proverbs is, it's a, it's a set of sayings used for wisdom. Proverbs 15, verse 17. Proverbs 15, 17. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fattened ox and hatred with it. Let me drag that by you again. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is. Herbs are just seasoning. It's just seasoning. It's just vegetables. And some translations may say better is a dinner of just vegetables because that's all you have than steak with hatred. One of those is better. And we're about, to, we're about to experience some of that. I may be a much thinner man when I stand here next year. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm lucky. But God says, Paul says in chapter 4, verse 13, this is, the, this, is the, this is the end of all this, that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Who is the one who strengthens? Christ is the one who strengthens. Absolutely. Unequivocally, the only strength that we have is a gift from Christ. Just as the gifts of God include the plans that he has for us, which include suffering. Absolutely will. I mean, you look at our country and where our, where our politics are going, suffering is on the horizon for us, ladies and gentlemen. We might have to fight. We might have to fight to stay in this building. We might have to finally, as men, stand up to bosses and say, hey, man, I know that you want me to come in on Sunday, but I don't work on Sundays. I understand what you need. I understand that. But... but my God is bigger than this company. We may have to stand up to coaches and say, we don't play on Sundays. We don't play on Wednesday nights. Kids, you may have to stand up to a coach and say, not, not with your chest out, but say privately, coach, I understand what you need, but y'all are going to have to do without me on Wednesdays and Sundays because my God is bigger than this team. Let me tell you something else. I've been on the field. I've been on the field with these coaches in Crosby, and they may, they may act big and tough, but you tell one of these coaches in Crosby that, that's all, you, that's all they'll say. I understand. I understand. You may have to make up stuff to stay on the team. You may not be able to stay on the team if you're, if you're with an ungodly, some ungodly people. You may not be able to. But if God is just an idol that you can put away because other things are more important, then he's not God. As I work to do all of what I want to do, 
I will put my faith in Christ, my plans in Christ, my desires, my wants, my prayers, my music, my, my work, my words, my wife, and my sons. All things refers to the things that we are required to do. The good works laid out beforehand by God himself. Look what it says in Ephesians 2, verse 10. Ephesians 2.10, just back just a couple of pages. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship. We are literally the creation of God himself, worked out by God, created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of good works, which God prepared beforehand. Read that again. Which God prepared beforehand. What did he prepare? He prepared good works beforehand that we should walk in them, them being the good works that he prepared. See, the good works that we have are not any path to salvation. There is no path to salvation through good works. In fact, Paul calls in Philippians the good works that he did before he was converted rubbish in verse three, in chapter 3, verse 8. Chapter 3, verse 8. Look what it says in chapter 3, verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the, because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them, all things, as rubbish. Let me, let me help you with this word rubbish, okay? The Greek word is skabalon, skabalon. Uh, some people pronounce it as skubalos or skubalon. But in the, in the Strong's, uh, Strong's Concordance, this word is skabalon, which literally means it's a, it's a very nice way. Rubbish is a very nice way of saying skabalon, which means the excrement of bulls. I count all of that as so worthless as to be a curse word. This is what we count our works outside of Christ. Our pressing for our kids to get into a good college instead of a solid biblical foundation. Our desire for a full wallet instead of a church who works its fingers to the bone to ensure your spiritual development. Skybalon. Now this is painful to dig deep within ourselves and create space in our hearts for Christ. Tossing out what doesn't belong, that we value for so long, but now we see as Skybalon. We are like, we're like the people in the episodes of Hoarders. It's such a sad thing to watch that. But I want you to take this metaphor and think about this for a second. People have lost their ever-loving minds to hold on to trash they're keeping things in their house from decades-old stacks of newspapers to literally, literally jars of their own excrement. It is important to those people to have it, to keep it, even though it could destroy their very lives in which they live. That's us when we try to hold on to our old lives and we will not be a new creation created in Christ. That's who we are, holding on to that trash, that skybalon, holding on to it and won't throw it on the fire, won't give it up to God. This is painful for us all, but for the Christian, this is called conviction, and conviction contains hope. It's guilt with hope. The devil gives guilt. The devil gives you guilt with no hope. He does not want you to feel any hope towards the, to, to the everlasting cross of Christ, to the everlasting gift, which is salvation. But conviction puts you down with guilt and lifts you up with hope that there is an end. There is a, there is a, there is a reason for the means that God has given you. Amen? While in college at ETBU, I developed a nerve condition called trigeminal neuralgia in which the pain receptors in my jaw start firing. I don't know if you've... It's very uncommon for a, for a young man to have it. Uh, and I was a young man at the time, believe it or not. Um... But what it does is, is as the pain receptors fire, there's no reason for them to fire. But it's just pain. You know, if you, have a, if you have a bum tooth, you can kind of push on it and feel the pain. You can kind of release some of that tension by just touching on it for a second. You can't put any cold water on it. But that's the only thing I could do was cold water to numb. The, I drank gallons and ga I, nearly, I nearly got water poisoning because of the pain that it was. I can only drink a little bit of cold water, hold it on my mouth for a second, and got a little, little, uh, little relief from it. But it was excruciating. And I'm not talking about excruciating like a, like a momentary pain, like the pulling of a tooth. This is like all of your teeth being pulled all at once. Excruciating. It was so bad that I actually pulled one of my teeth. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not playing with you. This one right back here, 
I grabbed a pair of channel locks and pulled a tooth because I thought that was going to fix it. Because I did have a bad tooth. I thought it was a toothache. And I pulled one of my own teeth. I couldn't go to the dentist. I didn't have any money. Couldn't go to the dentist. Nothing helped. But Jamie finally took me to the emergency room in, in, uh, in Marshall, Texas. And uh, they saw how much pain I was in. And, and she tried to explain to them that I'm not playing. I'm not on any drugs. This is not a fake. This is not a falsehood. Um, it, I couldn't work. I couldn't eat. I, it was just, it was horrible, horrible, horrible pain. They hit me with morphine to start off with, um, which is a pretty heavy drug if you don't know anything about morphine. And it did nothing because it, morphine doesn't treat nerve pain. It only treats musculoskeletal pain. And then they hit me with Dilaudid, which is another very high-powered opiate drug, very high-powered drug, uh, Dilaudid. And then they didn't do anything. I'm sitting there, I'm sitting there sounding like an, like an old cow that's dying because I'm, I'm doped up to my eyeballs with, with, with morphine and Dilaudid and still in massive pain because I can't drink the water because they think the water is something I'm not supposed to be drinking. And then they hit me with morphine again. Nothing helped until they gave me this one little pill called Neurontin. lady brought one little pill in and said, take this, and I snatched it out of her hand and put it in my mouth and took it because I was willing to do anything. I don't know if, if you, again, I'm going to say this, trigeminal neuralgia. Anybody ever heard of that before? It, it happens a lot in, in older ladies uh, in their 80s and 90s, um, and, and it's, 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 it's excruciating. You can only treat it with uh, gabapentin or neurontin and massive doses at that. It's called the suicide disease um, because I would, I would rather, there were many nights that I would rather take a bullet and end all of this than continue on in this pain. That's, that's how serious this is. But the one pill, the one pill in 10 minutes, I was a whole different person because the pain was treated properly. And if we don't continue, if we continue in trying to, to, to fix our pain in the wrong ways, then we'll never get past it. And we will continue in our pain forever until it ends us. When we moved to Crosby, I was having this pain once a year, and I would have to, I would have to keep um, large amounts of Neurontin with me at all times. And then when, it, when, the, when the waves started to hit, it was always in the summer, and I always had a summer job. I was always doing something else in the summer. The waves would start hitting, and I would, be able, I would, I would feel like I was going to die. And when we came to Crosby, I found this poem. I don't know where I found it. I don't remember where it came from. Um, but I just heard a piece of it, and I'm going to read it to you. But it helped me. It, it emotionally affected me. Like I'm, I'm not a poet guy. I'm not a poetry guy. Okay, as you can tell, you look. I'm not a guy that you look at and say, "Guy likes poetry." But I found this poem. It reads like this. Can you put that up, Paul? I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you see it too. It's called "On Pain" by Khalil Gibran. Khalil Gibran was a Lebanese poet who uh, who was uh, brought up in a Christian home, but was influenced by by Islamic culture in Lebanon. But he was a Christian man. You can see by the, by, the, by the words in the poem how serious he took his convictions. It reads like this. Your pain is the breaking of the shell that encloses your understanding. Even as the stone of the fruit must break, that its heart may stand in the sun, so must you know pain. And could you keep your heart in wonder at the daily miracles of your life, your pain would not seem less wondrous than your joy. And you would accept the seasons of your heart, even as you've always accepted the seasons that pass over your fields. And you would watch with serenity through the winters of your grief. Much of your pain is self-chosen. It's the bitter potion by which the physician within you heals your sick self. Therefore, trust the physician and drink his remedy in silence and tranquility. For his hand, though heavy and hard, is guided by the tender hand of the unseen. And the cup he brings, though it burn your lips has been fashioned of the clay which the potter has moistened with his own sacred tears. So this morning, the call is to trust the physician. Our pain is nothing compared to the eternal joy of his presence. Our pain is nothing, if not necessary to humble us, to bring us lower, to knock us down when we have gotten our head up in the clouds. When we've been, as Paul says, puffed up. We call it big head. He will give you the peace that passes all understanding. And all of the other fruits of the Spirit, if you will but have faith that He is who He says He is. We are great sinners, but Christ is a great Savior. He can do all things. 
He say, Paul, that means you have a chance. Pray with me, please.